Thank you everyone for joining us uh, today and welcome to our immigration session. My name is Laura Solano. I am the manager of international uh, recruitment and admission at NIPC University. Uh, we have set this webinar up with the purpose of uh, providing you with uh, professional immigration advice and to help answer all the questions that we know you have, especially during these difficult times that we, we have been through the last two years. Uh, today, I, I would like to introduce you to uh, Elizabeth Lon and Sia Sumar, both from uh, Lon Mangalji Law Group. They are immigration lawyers and they are located in Toronto. And they are here this morning to evening for some of you, of course, uh, to help you with your immigration journey, to help you with uh, understanding your status and the, uh, your path, the best path to follow, especially uh, when it comes to studying and living in Canada. I would like to, um, of course, um, thank you both, Elizabeth and Sia. We are really help, um, grateful for this opportunity. And um, we are just um, so excited to, to hear what you have to share with us this morning. Well, thank you so much, Laura. It's great to be here with you all. All right. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to go through um, your path to uh, get come to Canada and get permanent residence. Um, we'll be talking about um, first, you know, how to come to Canada. And I'm going to go through some tips, first of all, as to some background information as to what you need to think about. And uh, then we're going to talk about working while you're studying. We're going to talk about how to apply for the post-grad work permit. And then we're going to go on to some pathways towards permanent residence. Okay. So before we get started and before we talk about permanent residence, there's a few things that I wanted to share with you for some basic concepts for you to understand. The first thing that is very important for anyone who is going to have a temporary status in Canada is to understand what happens when your temporary status ends. So if you have a study permit, it will have an end date on your study permit, okay? If you apply before the study permit ends, the website on IRCC recommends 30 days, but that's just a recommendation, that's not the law. As long as you apply before, even the day of, before, you know, day of, I usually don't recommend last minute, but if you had no choice and you applied before it expires, you will still uh, be able to uh, keep your status until a decision is made. That's called implied status, okay? You will only get implied status if you submitted all of your forms and your fees uh, properly, okay? But let's say, um, let's, let me give you an example. For example, if my study permit expires mm, uh, December 31st, and I apply before December 31st, let's say I apply December 30th. If my uh, study permit extension, let's say I, I needed to extend it because my, my you know, studies are not done, right? So my studies, I need to extend it until end of April, okay? If I apply before and I get a decision on February, I can continue to study and um, until my new study permit is issued in February. Now, if I forget though to extend it before it expires, let's say I wake up on New Year's Day and oh, you know, I have such a headache from partying the night before. And I look at my uh, study permit, oh shoot, it expired yesterday. At that point, I don't have status anymore, okay? What can I do? Well, the law allows me 90 days from the time I lost my status to apply for restoration of status. But while I am waiting for restoration of status, I am not able to study, okay? 
So the difference between applying to extend your status before it expires, if I had filed it a few hours before on December 31st, compared to January 1st, it will mean the difference between um, being able to study in the next semester or losing an entire semester. So one of the first things you need to know is make sure when you have your study permit, circle the end date, the validity date on your calendar. You have at least three different uh, calendar reminders and make sure you apply properly before your status ends. Um, so there was a special policy for COVID uh, for the restoration timeline. For those of you who are already in Canada, if you had lost it after January 31st, you have until August 31st of this year. This is a special COVID timeline. But for those who are coming in, the normal uh, timeline is 90 days from the date that it, it, your status expires. Uh, one last concept that I want you to keep in mind, and this will be very important when we're applying for permanent residence, is most permanent residence applications in Canada they emphasize that they want to see high-skilled work experience. So what's high-skilled, what's low-skilled? The government has classified occupations into five different categories. O, A, and B are high-skilled, and C and D are low-skilled, okay? So let's play a little game here. I'm going to say an occupation, you, you guess whether or not it's high skilled or low skilled, okay? Uh, let's sit, take an office situation. Uh, a receptionist, that's low skilled. A secretary, that's high skilled. A bookkeeper, that's high skilled. A accounting clerk, that's low skilled. Medical assistant, that's high skilled. A dental assistant, that's low skilled, okay? So I don't know how many people you got right or positions you got right. I normally, normally a lot of people get these confused. What is high skill? I thought, you know, an accounting clerk is high skilled because bookkeeper is high skilled, right? Um, the point of this exercise is to show you that you can't always just make assumptions that an occupation is high skilled or low skilled. When you look for a job in Canada, or you know, when you, you know, when we do an assessment of someone's background to see whether or not they can meet the requirements for permanent residence, we really need to see what um, the actual occupation was. It's not about what you, uh, your position necessarily is called, but what you actually did in your duties uh, to see whether or not it would meet the requirements, okay? All right, Zia. Perfect. So for those of you that are outside of Canada, a big question right now is certainly, um, can I travel? What's gonna happen if I have to start my program online? How is that gonna affect me? Um, I'm going through the study permit process. All of these are great questions and certainly has been on the top of the mind for a lot of students um, over the last year and a half as we've been going through COVID. And so IRCC uh, has actually come out with special policies again because of COVID. And so if you have, as long as you have filed your study permit application online from outside of Canada, and you're waiting for that decision on the study permit application, um, you can start actually studying outside of Canada. So this first fall semester, you can be studying online, be outside of Canada, and still have that time count towards the postgrad work permit. So for students that are coming here, a big goal is usually to come, study, get your postgrad work permit, work in Canada, and eventually apply for permanent residence. That's generally the path that we're, we're looking at for a lot of international students. And so we always wanna make sure 
that when you're studying, when you're working towards completing your program here, that you're maintaining your eligibility for the post-grad work permit. And so one major concern that came up, and we'll talk about the post-grad work permit eligibility in that process of applying in a couple minutes, but one of the big questions that has always come up is if we start studying online, one, we don't have our study permit approved yet, is that going to be a problem? And second, um, am I still going to be eligible for the postgrad work permit? And so this is where this special policy has come out. And so they've actually extended it to this fall semester, this uh, upcoming semester for September, to say that yes, you can start studying online. And as long as your study permit is eventually approved, you'll be able to still count that time um, that you've been studying towards your postgrad work permit. Now, when you're actually booked your flight and you're looking to come to Canada, um, a couple things that you need to keep in mind. Right now, in order to be able to enter Canada as a student, you have to meet two requirements. The first is you have to have either um, your valid study permit or a letter of introduction. So that's the approval letter that you get from IRCC once your study permit application has been approved online. And the second thing is that you have to be attending a DLI, a designated learning institution that has a COVID-19 readiness plan, which has been approved by the province. Okay, so as long as you meet these two requirements, you're able to travel to Canada and start studying here. Now, there are still other requirements in order to be able to board your flight. Okay, and so in order to be able to board, you do need to first undergo a COVID test within 72 hours of your flight. Okay, so 72 hours before you're boarding your flight, the flight to Canada, um, you do have to have a COVID test completed and be able to show that it is a negative test. When you're traveling and when you're setting your travel date, you do want to keep in mind that the general timeline for that the CBSA Canada Border Services Agency uh, accepts for students entering Canada is within the four weeks before the start of your program. Okay, so I know certainly a, a question generally comes up saying, you know, I want to uh, make that transition. I want to move to Canada two months before so I can settle in and, and you know, I can start um, getting accustomed to the different cities and, and the new environment that I'm in. But generally, uh, the, the rule of thumb is to look at coming about at the most four weeks before your the start of your program. And then lastly, Recently, IRCC has removed the quarantine requirement for individuals who are fully vaccinated with an approved vaccine. And it has to have been at least 14 days since you've received the final dose of your vaccine. Okay, so basically right now we still do have a quarantine requirement. So individuals that are entering Canada are required to quarantine for a period of 14 days. The exemption to that is for fully vaccinated travelers who have received one of the approved um, vaccines, right? So we're talking about uh, Pfizer, uh, Johnson Johnson, Moderna, and AstraZeneca. I think those are the four that, that Canada has approved. And so if you have received um, the full dose of one of those approved vaccines and your last dose was at least 14 days ago, then you may be exempt from that quarantine requirement. So some things to keep in mind when you're thinking of traveling uh, to Canada. Wonderful. All right, so let's say you have now come to Canada, okay? If you're outside of Canada studying, working, it's none of the Canadian immigration's business other than your ability to get the post-grad work permit. So you can certainly do whatever you like with work outside of Canada. Once you do come into Canada though, um, they, this, your restrictions on work um, are there, okay? So first of all, to maintain your student status, very importantly, you have to be actively pursuing your studies. Even if your study permit does not expire for a long time, if you at any point stop studying, for over 90 days, then you could lose your status. Um, there are two 
um, exceptions to this rule. One is if you are on a scheduled break. What's a scheduled break? It's a break that is um, put on to the academic calendar by your school. For example, if you have a summer break, everybody who is in your program will have that break. And that's a scheduled break, okay? That you can, that doesn't count towards that 90 days. The other thing that is there is if there's an authorized leave. What an authorized leave is, is for yourself to ask the school to give you a special exemption for a leave. Oftentimes this has something to do with medical reasons or you need to go and travel to be with your family for you know, some, some particular reason, um, you know, sometimes there's academic probation, whatever it is, you must first get the permission of the school to allow you to go for authorized leave, okay? Authorized leave is, can be only be for a maximum of 150 days. If it's over 150 days, then it's no longer counted as authorized leave and the clock starts ticking again for the 90 days. All right. So, um, and then, so you cannot work while you're on authorized leave, full time or part time at all. When you are on a scheduled break, okay, you can work full time on a scheduled break. Now, this is only if you are a full-time student. If you at any point become a part-time student, except in the last semester, you're not allowed to work at all. Uh, while you are studying and you're in classes, you're allowed to work 20 hours a week. On scheduled breaks, you're allowed to work full-time. Um, there's no limit to that. If you are in uh, working on campus, on campus, you can work as much as you like as well, okay? Now, remember I said you can only work while you're a full-time student. So when you have completed your studies, when the school gives you the notice that you finished your program, you are no longer a student and then you have to stop working. Okay, you can't work full time, you can't work part time at all. The only exception to this is if you finished one program and you're going to start another program within 150 days of completing the first program. So let's say you finish a one year program um, and it ends in April, end of April, and you've already been accepted and you're going to do another program, start another program in September. In that case, you can work in the summer. OK. Um, also, uh, during COVID, this is especially during COVID, if by chance your classes are canceled because of COVID and you have to uh, you can't go to class anymore, you can still work part time uh, during that semester. All right, Zia. Perfect. So Elizabeth went over the when you can work using your study permit. Once you're done your program, right? Like Elizabeth said, you can no longer work using that study permit. And so the next step is to apply for your post-graduation work permit. Now, the PGWP, as it's often called, it's an open work permit, okay? It basically allows you to work for any company in any position anywhere in Canada, okay? So it's a unique opportunity that's given to international students once you've finished your program of study here in Canada. Now, the first question you should be asking yourself is, should I apply for this post-grad work permit? And the reason that this is an important question is because you can only qualify for the PGWP once in your life, okay? So it's kind of like a unicorn. It's only gonna come around once, all right? And so you want to make sure that when you apply for, when you receive your postgrad work permit, you're able to maximize the time that you have on this work permit because 
that's generally um, the time that you'll get your work experience so you can qualify and apply for your permanent residence. Okay, so like I said, this comes around only once. Right? Now, with COVID, of course, we've had a number of special policies and one of the very amazing policies that have come out is allowing uh, individuals who are currently on a postgrad work permit to extend the validity for an additional 18 months. So um, that's very specific to COVID. It's not something that we've seen prior to this wonderful time. Um, and so yeah, I think actually this policy, if you haven't already applied to extend it, it's already done because the deadline was July 27th which was, I yeah, think, that's right. Today, we right? actually just so finished. Just that's started. right. We're already on the 28th. So good yeah. point. Yeah, mm -hmm. that surprisingly went by quickly. But yes, that's done. Yes. So mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so basically individuals who had the who have applied are able to um, extend it for an additional 18 months. Now, the postgrad work permit itself, like I said, it's an open work permit. So it allows you to work for any company. The length of that postgrad work permit will be dependent on the length of the program that you've completed. So if your program is anywhere between eight months to under two years, then the length of your postgrad work permit will be exactly the same length of your program. So if you did a one year program, for example, you'd be eligible for a one year postgrad work permit. Now, if your program is two years or longer, then you're eligible for a three year work permit, which is the maximum length. Now, when IRCC is um, looking and calculating the length of your postgrad work permit, we're looking at the specific length of your program and not the amount of time it takes you specifically to complete it. So if you accelerate and you do a two-year program um, in 18 months, for example, then you still may be eligible for that full three-year work permit because the stated length of your program is two years or longer. Additionally, you can combine programs together. So let's say, for example, you do two one-year programs. Um, you can likely combine those two programs together to show that you've studied for a period of two years in Canada and again, be eligible for that maximum duration uh, three-year work permit. Now, in order to be eligible for the postgrad work permit, one of the biggest aspects is to ensure that you have maintained full-time student status in each semester of your program. And that's a very key word. It's each semester. So every semester while you're studying here in Canada, it is very important to be a full-time student. The definition of full-time will depend on your school. Okay, so it may vary depending on um, where exactly you're studying, but really important uh, to ensure that every semester you're enrolled as a full-time student. The exceptions to that are if you are on an authorized leave, like Elizabeth talked about in the last slide, same definition for authorized leave, um, or if you're in your final semester. So students who uh, do not require a full-time course load in only their final semester, um, then that's one of the exceptions. So you can be a part-time student in your final, in your last semester and still qualify for that postgrad work permit. And again, we are seeing um, exceptions for COVID, right? So if you had canceled classes, if you, um, you know, had to end, ended up on a part-time uh, basis because of COVID, because classes were canceled because of COVID, that will not affect your eligibility for that post-grad work permit, okay? Now, um, one thing to keep in mind is that online courses, so doing programs online, that aspect of being an online student is considered to be distance learning, okay? So distance learning can actually affect your eligibility for the postgrad work permit. The general rule is that if your distance learning, so if your online learning is under 50%, um, then it can, then it may be so be fine. But if you're over the 50%, that can completely affect the eligibility entirely for the postgrad work permit. Okay, so it's something to keep in mind. Now, 
Of course, we did talk about this earlier in saying that IRCC has allowed for students to start studying online outside of Canada and still maintain eligibility for that postgrad work permit. And that this is why this um, policy has come into place is because we've always had uh, online learning affect eligibility and length of your postgrad work permit. Now, with that being said, if you've completed even your full program outside of Canada and completely online, um, as long as your studies were between the spring 2020 semester um, and the end of this year, so December 31st, uh, 2021, all of that time that you've spent studying online will still count towards the length of your postgrad work permit. And even if you've completed two programs, all of that does count um, because of COVID, we do have these special policies in place. Now, Elizabeth mentioned in, in the previous um, slide that you can study, so you can work on your study permit up until you've received any written confirmation that you've completed your program of study. So on your study permit, you have to stop working as soon as you've received notification from your school that you're done. Now, you can begin working full time as soon as you apply for your postgrad work permit. As long as your study permit is still valid at the time that you submit your postgrad work permit application. Okay, so to go over that, you're on your study permit, you're able to work part time until you've received a, a written confirmation that you've completed your program of study. At that point, you do have to stop working entirely. And then once you've applied for the postgrad work permit, you may be able to start working full time while you're waiting for a decision on that postgrad work permit application, as long as you do have a valid study permit at the time of your application. Um, did you want to talk about the when they should apply for the 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 90 days? Oh, yes, definitely. Good point. Mm -hmm. So the postgrad work permit, you have a timeline as to when you can apply. OK, so the rule online when you go onto IRCC's website is that you need to submit that uh, postgrad work permit application within 180 days of your uh, of the completion of your program. However, if you're inside of Canada, your study permit becomes invalid the earlier of the expiry date that's listed on your study permit or 90 days following the completion of your program. So it's important to know when your study permit is valid until because that does affect when you're applying for your postgrad work permit. So if you're in Canada, you do need to have valid status at the time of your application. And so even though IRCC's website says you have 180 days, the reality is that you may only have that 90 days following the, the completion of your program um, to apply for your postgrad work permit. Mm -hmm. um, one of the uh, reasons why we recommend 90 days is that in order for you to be able to work while waiting for your work permit, sometimes the work permits come very fast, but oftentimes they can take a few months to come. And oftentimes you'll want to start working as soon as you want, as you, soon as you can. So if you apply within this rule of when your study permit is still valid and 90 days, whichever comes first, okay, you'll be able to start working while you're waiting for your uh, work permit to come. If you don't, let's say you say, okay, well, I'm just going to apply, I'm going to procrastinate and apply 150 days. At that point, you would have lost your status, so you will have to spend money to file a restoration of status uh, for your study permit, and you will also need to, uh, you cannot work until you uh, get your work permit, okay? So just keep in mind, 90 days, study permit, whichever comes first, that's your deadline to apply. All right, let's 
start uh, talking about permanent residence. The first one I want to talk about is express entry. You may all have heard about express entry. Express entry is the most well known permanent residence program for Canada. Um, and what happens is first you create an online profile. Okay, a lot of people think, oh, I've created an online profile. I have applied for permanent residence then. Wrong. When you create an online profile, you have just indicated to the government that you are, you first of all qualify under one of three categories, the federal skilled worker class, Canadian experience class, or the federal skilled trades. And you uh, are interested in becoming, you're a candidate. When you enter an online profile, you have not applied for permanent residence yet. It's not counted as that, okay? When you enter your profile, you get into the express entry pool for one year. And if you don't have enough points, you after one year, they'll cancel your profile. So it's not just about getting into the pool. It's also about whether or not you'll be able to get out of the pool. So when you get into the pool, you get a series of points, a score, uh, based on your background and based on whether or not you have provincial nomination. And it, every um, couple weeks or so, the government will have a draw where they announce a number based on not only your number, but the category that you qualify under, okay? And if you belong to your score is higher than that number that they announced and you belong to the category, then you'll get an invitation to apply. All right, so let's break it down more simply into, first of all, how to get into the pool. Uh, the one that a lot of you may already qualify for is the federal skilled worker class. So under this category, you have to have at least one year of high skilled work experience anywhere in the world that is continuous, that you have at least 1,560 hours, which is equal to 30 times uh, 52, so 30 hours a week uh, on average. You need to have at least one year of work experience that's high skilled, continuous in the same occupation. Okay, so it could be anywhere in the world, you could be self employed, um, and it could be while you're studying in Canada. Okay, um, you have to have an IELTS of 6.0 in each category, um, and or self PIP of seven in each category. Um, they then with to calculate federal skilled worker points, this is not the express entry points, this is specific federal skilled worker points of 67 based on the rest of uh, your background. You also need to have a financial savings as well um, that you can show will support yourself in Canada. So that's a federal skilled worker class. And this is the one where, you know, we have clients from around the world who've never even come to Canada before who have qualified under this and they have been invited to apply and have gotten their permanent residence this way. Now, the thing about this category is this year because of COVID, the government has not invited yet anyone under the federal skilled worker class. Uh, prior to COVID, they were inviting people regularly under this class. It remains to be seen what they'll be doing after the borders start opening. Um, but so far, even for people who have had really high scores, um, this has not been the category that has been invited this year. In general, the scores for the federal skilled worker class are quite high. Uh, prior to COVID, they were holding steady at around the 470s range. Sometimes they dropped a little bit to the very high 490s, but around that range. The second category is the one where if you have work experience in Canada, and this work experience is very specific, very different from the federal skilled worker work experience. The work experience for the Canadian experience class is one year of high skilled work experience that you gain in Canada when you are not a full-time student and 
um, it is something where you are working as an employee, you're not self-employed, okay? So um, this is work experience that you will get after you graduate, okay? And you get your post-grad work permit, you work for a year in a high-skilled job as an employee, it doesn't have to be continuous. It doesn't have to be related to your studies. It doesn't have to be uh, in a, a one occupation. You can count your hours uh, from different jobs together, um, but it has to be at least one year, at least 1,560 hours, and you have to be employed, okay? Um, and then, um, you know, there's a language exam as well. So this one is very interesting. COVID is, has made immigration very different from pre-COVID days. So prior to COVID, these classes were all jumbled together. It was just the score, the announcement was for everybody who qualified under these two classes. During COVID though, the government has been inviting people, especially for the Canadian experience class, um, and therefore, the points have been very, very low. At one point, they just invited almost everybody in uh, the pool that qualified under Canadian experience in the class. It was a very big draw of 27,000 people. And all these, uh, a lot of people were really happy to, to get out because their scores may have been really, really low and they still were able to get it. Um, since then, the scores have been very low, historic lows of, you know, in the 300s. Uh, so um, that's something that is there. Whether or not they will stay this low after COVID remains to be seen. Uh, there is one more that I'm not going to talk too much about. It's uh, for the skilled trades. Um, it's specific to a lot of construction trades, cooks and chefs. And you will either need to have a LMIA where the employer has shown they can't find a Canadian to do the job, or you will need to have certification, provincial certification. For the most part, uh, this probably won't apply to most of you. All right, so as I've said, let's say you are all now in the pool, okay? Uh, I have four people in the pool, right? So let's say the invitation was for Canadian Experience Class of 387. Okay, who's gonna get out? Well, it really depends on what category these people qualify under. So, you know, may, it seems like everybody should be able to get out, but it depends, well, if, if Troop T is actually a federal skilled worker, she won't be invited to apply, right? If Anna is, Canadian experience class, she would. So right now it's not just about the score, it's also about the category. All right, so let's talk about how the scores are going to be ranking there, okay? The first of all is age. Once you get to your 30th birthday, it's no longer happy birthday. Every year you get older, okay? Um, it's not about life. I love getting older, but when it comes to express entry, it's about um, every time it's your after 30, your scores go 30, actually 30 score starts dropping at five to six points. In your 40s, a fast slide, minus 10, minus 11 points every time you get older. By the time you get to the 45th birthday, uh, you know, the... the Good news is you don't go down anymore. The bad news is you get a big fat zero for your age. So not a lot you can do about age, except you want to be cognizant of it and apply when you can. Um, education is a big factor. For those people who are able to get really high points in the 470s, we are normally looking at someone who has at least two degrees, one of them or two completed two post-secondary programs, and at least one of them is a three-year program, okay? And of course, um, and I'll show you afterwards, when you come to Canada and you have completed a program in Canada, like in Nipissing, 
Uh, if it's a master's program, you will get 30 points. Uh, if it is a three-year program, you get 30, 30 points. Um, if it's a one-year to two-year program, that's not a master's or PhD. Uh, I don't think there are PhD programs that's one or two years. But if it's one or two years, it's not a master's program, uh, then you get 15 points. Language um, is very, very important as well. If you're looking at the 370s, 380s, you're looking at um, getting a score for your IELTS of sevens in reading, writing, and speaking, eight in listening at least. Um, Self-pip would be nine in each category. If you know French, it's even better. If you if you have a you know have good French level, um, then your points are very high. Relevant Canadian work experience. So this is the work experience that is very similar to the Canadian experience class. This is the work experience you gain when you're not a full-time student and you're employed, okay? So um, when you get your post-grad work permit, why do we talk about the post-grad work permit? Because it's your golden ticket to getting permanent residence. And getting your study permit is the first step towards you getting that post-grad work permit. Completing it, and then applying for it properly, that's very important. One of the reasons we like to speak to you now before you start your journey is to make sure that you don't um, start it on the wrong foot. You don't start studying part-time or dropping classes or et cetera, okay? Because the post-grad work permit is very, very specific. Foreign work experience. This is high skilled work experience that you would have gained outside of Canada within the last 10 years. There is a certain level um, in the one to two year range. And if you have three years, you also jump as well. Um, spouse, you know, it depends on your spouse, right? If your spouse is a super spouse and they have very high education or language, um, Canadian work experience, you know, those will give them points and uh, they could add to your application. Otherwise, sometimes if your spouse doesn't have speak English very well or their education is lower, uh, it may, it's around the same, but it may lower your score a little bit. But here's the thing about spouses. In Canada, we have different definitions of spouses. You, you don't just need to be married. If you are common law, if you have lived together for at least one year, they are defined as a spouse for you. And if you, when they ask you what your status is, what your marital status is, and you have lived with someone for at least one year, and you don't say, you don't declare them as common law, you say you're single, that's misrepresentation, okay? And later on, that can come back and bite you. And you could be barred from Canada for five years. You um, could be barred from ever sponsoring them after your permanent residence. So, um, you know, a lot of people think, oh, it's just easier if I don't declare, you know, my, my partner. I love them, but, or I may not love them, whatever it is, okay? Whether you love them or not love them, it doesn't matter. If you have lived with them for one year, they're defined as your common law, declare them, okay? All right, um, provincial, oh, by the way, they don't have to be, just one last thing, they don't have to be accompanying you. They don't have, you can still score as a single person, but you have to declare them. Um, the provincial nominee program, um, will, uh, Zia will be talking about this. Um, not all provincial nominee programs will give you 600 points for express entry. They have to be an express entry linked provincial nominee program. Um, that will give you 600 points. And Zia will be talking about this afterwards. Like I said, previous study in Canada, uh, Nipissing University, you're doing well. You've, that's a good decision because that will certainly give you a lot of points uh, for, uh, for this as well. Um, and it will give you the ability to get your postgrad work permit. Arranged employment. A lot of people think, oh, I have a job offer, then I have arranged employment. No. For post-grad work permits, it does not count. You have to have an employer-specific work permit or LMIA, and then you have to have the job offer and work for the company. Uh, so it's it won't apply to you guys because you guys are on an open work permit with a post-grad work permit. 
Siblings, you get 15 points if you have siblings who are Canadian or permanent residents and they're living in Canada. Like I said, ability to speak fluent French. You'll see that if you are able to speak French, not just speak, but read, write, listen, speak, um, and you're at a very high fluency level, uh, then we may be able to get you a lot of points for permanent residence. When I say, you know, fluency in French, it's not necessarily I'm saying to you, go and learn French if you have never learned French before, okay? Everybody's circumstances is different unless you're one of those phenoms who um, are very, are able to learn a language in a year or so. I wouldn't necessarily waste time just going and learning French, okay? This is if you already have that ability, uh, then it could give you uh, the necessary points. Trade certification, it doesn't normally apply to you. I've had very few people apply with trade certification. This is for um, the, the construction trades, um, cooks and chefs. There's a special provincial trade certification for them. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, over to so you. We've spoken about the federal programs, right? We've spoken about the three main ones, which was federal skilled workers, uh, Canadian business class and federal school trades. That's what Elizabeth just covered right now when she was talking about express entry. Now, comparatively, there's also provincial programs. So when we're talking about any of the provincial programs, it's important to understand that a province is basically helping to facilitate your application. Province can't actually grant permanent residence. It's always gonna be a multiple step process. You're first applying to the province for a nomination. And then once you have that nomination, you're applying to IRCC for your permanent residence. And so every province is different, okay? Every province has their own uh, different streams, different criteria, different um, programs. We're gonna be focusing on Ontario's programs. So when we look at Ontario, the easiest way to divide them are those that are with that work with express entry and those that are outside of express entry. So because Elizabeth just finished talking about express entry, we're going to start with the express entry streams. Now, the first step whenever we're talking about any of the three Ontario express entry streams is that because it works with express entry, you first have to have a profile and be in the express entry pool. Okay, so these streams, the way that they work is you create a, pro a profile in the federal express entry um, pool, right? So that means that you first have to qualify through one of the programs that Elizabeth just talked about. You go into the pool of applicants, and then from there, Ontario um, selects you and issues you what's called a notification of interest. So it's basically a letter to you that says, uh, come apply to us, we're interested in you. And so at that point, you have a certain period of time to prepare and submit your application to Ontario. Okay, so let's take a look at the categories um, that Express Entry, that Ontario has for their Express Entry streams. So the first one is called the Human Capital Priority Stream. Now, this is for individuals who've qualified under the Federal Skilled Worker or Canadian Experience Class programs. Okay, um, in terms of eligibility criteria, there is, you do need to have at least a bachelor's degree. Okay, so when we're talking about um, human capital priority stream, we are required to have at minimum um, a Canadian bachelor's, master's, or PhD, or the equivalent from uh, a country outside of Canada. If you do have um, a credential from outside of Canada, you do need to have an education assessment done. The other criteria for the human capital priority stream is your language needs to be a minimum of CLB7, and there is a savings requirement uh, for the, the human capital priority stream. Now, the way Ontario has been doing these, uh, the human capital priority stream is that they've been focusing on, they've been doing specific draws. So that means that they're looking at everybody in the express entry pool that meets their criteria for the human capital priority stream and then distilling it down to a smaller group and issuing these notifications of interest. And so the two uh, main categories that they've been doing are general draws where they've selected specific occupations 
And the most recent was actually just yesterday where they did a massive draw of over a thousand people. And they had, I think a total of, um, I think it was 13 occupations if I'm not mistaken, that they selected, okay? And so they, if individuals had experience in one of those occupations and fell within the CRS points range that they were looking at, then they would have received a notification of interest. And similarly, Ontario has also been doing what are called tech draws, okay? So again, they have um, identified a total of six tech occupations and they've been doing specific draws um, for these uh, occupations. The second program is the skilled trades program. So Ontario has a specific stream for skilled trades. Here you do have to have a minimum of a year of work experience specifically in Ontario in one of the listed trades. So when we look at this program, um, Ontario has identified um, skilled trades. They've listed skilled trades for this program. And so again, we're talking about construction trades. You do have to have this one year of work experience within the past two years from the date that you're submitting your application. Um, and that work experience has had to have been on a valid work permit. So a postgrad work permit is a valid work permit. You can use your work experience that you've obtained um, on your postgrad work permit to qualify for this program. This also does, the skilled trades program does require that you're living in Ontario and that you hold a valid work permit at the time that you apply. So really important things to keep in mind um, for the skilled trades program. And then the last express entry stream that I want to look at is the French uh, for French speaking skilled workers. So in this program, you do need to have uh, proficiency in both English and French. Okay, and so we're looking at the CLB seven at minimum for French and CLB six in English. And when we're talking about these, we're, we're saying CLB seven, but we're, we do mean in every aspect of the test. So these language tests do have four aspects, reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And so you do have to meet the minimum seven or six um, in all four categories. And again, with this French speaking skilled worker stream, um, OINP is focusing on candidates within the skilled worker and Canadian experience class programs. And you do need to have a minimum of a bachelor's degree or higher in order to qualify. Now, there are, like I said, other streams that don't fall under express entry. And so one of them is the employer-based stream. So this is for individuals who have a permanent full-time job offer with a qualifying employer, okay? Now, when we say qualifying employer, that means that we're looking at the company that's offering you the position and there are specific requirements for them as well. So when we, so basically there's income requirements for the company, the number of employees and how long they've been in business. The specific numbers do depend on where the company is located. So where you'll be working. If you're inside of the GTA, then the company needs to have grossed an income of at least $1 million in their past fiscal year. And they need to have five full-time uh, Canadian or permanent resident employees at the time of uh, your application. Comparatively, if the employer is outside of the GTA, then that gross income requirement decreases to 500,000 and they only need to have three full-time uh, Canadian or permanent resident employees at the time of your application. Regardless, the business does need to be in business for at least three years from the date uh, that you're applying. Now, the specific streams that fall under these employer-based job offer uh, programs for OINP, the first one is the for international students, okay? Now, whenever we're looking at, so this international student um, stream does require a job offer that's high skilled, but one of the biggest benefits of the international student stream is that the, prevail, the wage that you're being offered only needs to meet the entry level wage, okay? So, your employer, when we're looking at jobs, there's um, what are considered prevailing wages and entry level wages. And so with the international student stream, um, employers only need to be offering you the entry level wage. These wages are specific to the uh, position that's being offered to you. So the specific NOC code and the location of your employment. So all of these are important to consider when you're looking at um, what the minimum requirements are for you specifically. 
you do have to apply within two years of completing your program. And there are only specific programs as well that Ontario will accept um, in order to qualify under the international student stream. So either you've completed a two-year program um, or a one-year postgraduate program from a public university or college. Now, if it's a postgraduate program, then um, it does actually need to have as a requirement a previous bachelor's degree or higher uh, in, as one of your entry requirements. If the entry requirement for your program is a bachelor's degree or experience um, or anything else, then that program will unfortunately no longer qualify for the Ontario program. So something very important to keep in mind. Now with the international student stream, the other benefit is that you don't need to have any work experience in your occupation. So basically you can finish your program. You can finish, for example, a bachelor's program here in Canada, uh, get that full-time permanent job offer um, and then look at applying immediately through that international student stream. Comparatively, there's the foreign uh, skilled, uh, sorry, the skilled worker stream for the Ontario. Um, it still does need to be a high skilled job offer that you're receiving, but you do have to have, uh, your employer does have to be offering you the median wage for your occupation in the location that you're uh, working in. Um, with, the, with this skilled worker stream, you do need to have at least two years of work experience within the past five years in the same occupation that your job offer is in. Now, those, that work experience doesn't necessarily have to be in Canada, it can be from anywhere in the world, but it does have to be within the five years prior to when you apply for this program. And then lastly, we have the in-demand um, in demand stream. So with the in-demand stream, Ontario has identified again certain occupations that qualify for uh, this particular stream. You do need to have at least nine months of work experience in Ontario in that particular occupation. Now the list of occupations does vary depending on where you're uh, applying from, so where your job offer is. Um, if it's within the GTA, there's a smaller group of, of occupations that are eligible, um, but there are additional occupations for individuals uh, who have a position that are that's being offered to them outside of the GTA. Um, actually, Zia, you know and what I forgot to put out yeah. there is the master stream. <laughs> so in addition to these uh, two uh, streams, we do also have programs for master's graduates and PhD graduates. And this, again, is a very important program to, to think about. Um, and so basically with the master stream, it's for individuals who have completed a master's program in Ontario. Um, and so you have to, the, the program that you've, the master's program needs to be, again, completed within the past two years um, from when you're applying. Uh, it has to be at least one year in length. There's again, language requirements and settlement fund requirements um, for the master's stream. And then the second program is the PhD graduates program. With the PhD graduates program, um, again, as the, the name suggests, you have to have finished your PhD in Ontario, um, but there's no language requirement for the, PhD, uh, for the PhD program. There's still savings requirement, but there's no minimum language requirement for the PhD program. Now, important to note that these employer-based streams and, and the master stream and the PhD stream, the way that Ontario is receiving and processing these applications has changed this year. So it used to be that when you were ready to apply, you would go onto Ontario's website. Um, and if the stream was open, you were able to register and submit your application. Um, but that changed this year. So as of 2021, Ontario has now created an expression of interest system. So the three employer based job offer streams that you see on the slide right now, along with the masters and the PhD streams, they're all falling through this expression of interest system. So basically the first step once you qualify is to create a profile in Ontario's pool Right? So basically you're creating a profile, you're saying that you're, you're telling Ontario you're interested 
uh, in a plug through one of their programs. And then from there, Ontario, very similar to, to Express Entry, they're creating, they're, you get a score based on the stream that you're applying through. So the scoring system is different depending on the, the particular program that you're, that you're qualifying through. Um, you get a score, you put into the pool of applicants. And then from there, Ontario is doing draws and issuing invitations to candidates so that you can then apply for your um, provincial nomination. Now, importantly, once you get an invitation, you only have 14 days to prepare and submit your application. So not a lot of time um, to, to actually get that application in. So really important to be prepared in advance of actually receiving that invitation. And secondly, each of these streams are separate. So they're separate pools, separate scoring systems, and separate draws that are being done. Now, Ontario has already started or opened the system for the employer-based stream. So these three streams that you see again on the slide right now, um, they are accepting profiles, expressions of interest for them right now. The masters and PhD streams, they have not opened um, the pools for them as yet. So it's supposed to come within the next couple of months. So we're, we're eagerly waiting for that to open. Um, but right now the, the international student stream, the uh, skilled worker and the in-demand streams are open and all of them have actually done draws so far. So one of the things that you need to keep in mind is these programs that Zia has talked about, they're not the employer requirements, master's, PhD. These are not express entry. For some people, this is a good thing because your points may not be competitive through express entry. Um, the scoring, although there is a pool and there's a scoring right now, is very different from express entry. For example, age is not a factor in these categories. Um, so um, keep in mind also that the timing uh, is important. If you already are going to graduate and you're going to be doing this, um, this year, a lot of people are applying under express entry who are in Canada. And they made this categories, these categories, uh, there are not as many people going in there because they don't need to go in there. Okay. Um, so this might be a good time if you don't really have a good chance under express entry to go into the pool for this. Um, when someone comes to our office, we need to take into account their entire situation to map out a proper plan as to how we're going to do this. There are benefits and disadvantages for every single program here. And the best one is not a one size fits all. That's why there are so many different programs. If it's just one size fits all, then everybody would just, we just need one program. Okay, um, it depends on your own circumstances. So I'm just gonna go into uh, quickly into some couple of other programs that you're lucky enough to be able to qualify uh, for the N uh, RNIP, uh, the RNIP, okay? So uh, if you're in North Bay, it's one of the participating communities and um, you can either have uh, so basically, if you have a job offer uh, from North Bay and uh, you are able to um, uh, qualify otherwise, so um, A, the job is uh, recommended from the uh, community and it, it's, it's from there and you yourself are qualified, you have at least one year of work experience or if you're not, um, you are master's students, or you have been doing a two-year program full-time in, in the community, then uh, you can qualify. Um, and need to have a qualifying job offer in the community, and you need to meet the language uh, benchmark as well, which is a little bit lower, okay? Work in Canada or have settlement funds. So that's something that you might be able to uh, be able to think, okay, you know what? That's something that I could strive for because I'm in the qualifying community. Um, Zia, you wanna talk about the caregiver program? This is a program I think maybe some of you guys may not be interested, but if you have spouses, 
that are coming with you, uh, they might be, uh, this might interest them. Yeah, so the caregiver program is basically for individuals who are, uh, who have at least two years of work experience in Canada, caring for either children or um, it can be for elderly um, people, for example, but it has to be care that's being provided in a private home. Okay, so with the caregiver programs, there's basically two streams. You have your care, your, uh, your stream for, for children and your stream for home support worker stream. And so basically you need 24 months in either of these occupations, either caring for children or uh, being a home support worker. Now, the other requirements are that you do need to have at least one year uh, credential, post-secondary credential, you have to have completed at least a one-year program, and there is a language requirement um, of at least CLB5 for either of the, the child caregiver stream or the home support worker stream. But that, sorry, but that's it. <laughs> but that's <laughs> it. Are, that's it, exactly. So the, the program is, in, in terms of eligibility criteria, it's a lot uh, last, the big thing is, is really having that 24 months um, of work experience in Canada. So like Elizabeth said, you know, it may not be, uh, you may be studying, you may be doing your program here and a sp your spouse may be actually um, already taking care of some of children, for example, um, in a private home. And so they may be eligible for the caregiver program. Okay. This is where you team up with your spouse. If your spouse is a uh, open work permit because you have a study permit and they are eligible for the open work permit, then what they can do is maybe work towards permanent residence so that when you graduate, uh, they may already qualify under the permanent residence. And it doesn't matter who applies as a principal applicant. One person applies, the entire family can get it. And that's an All important right. point, yeah. right? Like you're saying, Elizabeth, it really does. You can really be looking at um, both spouses, right? So if you're coming here as a family unit, you have two opportunities now to, to qualify and apply for permanent residence. And so any of these programs that we've talked about today, um, you as the international student may be able to qualify after you finish your program, or your spouse may be able to qualify in advance of that. Absolutely. That's why when we have consultations, we like to have both, uh, the, the, both uh, you and your spouse together um, because it affects you as a family and both of you play a role in the immigration journey, okay? It goes back to the, the whole one size doesn't fit everyone, right? That's right, that's right. All right, so, you know, um, I'd like to just give you a few pieces of advice to take home with you um, as to what you need to do next, okay? The first thing is have a plan. Immigration is very much about planning. If you don't have a plan, you will kick yourself um, for probably kick yourself afterwards for doing certain things that you didn't need to do, for wasting time to uh, wasting time and money. Know where you want to go. Now, the immigration plan very well may change because immigration rules do change. But overall, those people who have come to us and we have had a plan for them are much, much more successful usually than someone who hasn't had any plan come to us after you know a while and may have shot themselves in the foot by doing something wrong. They didn't realize that what they were doing um, and, and, you know, basically screwed up their chances. Um, once you have your goal, you need to know, you need to actually implement it, right? You may need to study and practice for the exams or the IELTS. Don't think that, oh, my English is good. I don't have any issues. I have many, many people who have, whose first language is English or French, and they have done the exams and they have come in, like that was hard. And they may have, you know, not been ready for what they were supposed to do and scored a much lower score than they uh, should have scored. Okay, so study, take the practice exams, make sure that you know uh, exactly what you're supposed to do for this so you can maximize your score. Okay, uh, make sure that you have the programs that you need. Right, Nipissing is a very good uh, university, um, and 
it has a lot of immigration benefits. The RNIP, the fact that you know it's outside of the GTA uh, for the provincial programs, it's a university, so you can um, get the points for uh, you know postgrad cert uh, certificate, um, masters, uh, bachelor's degree. A lot of very very good programs there. Have your plan and make sure that you're doing the programs that you need to do to get your postgrad work permit for three years, for example, if you need it. Okay. Uh, and that's my third point. Maybe you might be a phenom and you're able to just get a job right away uh, before you graduate. Maybe you might not be able to do so. Oftentimes we see people who are only able to get a one-year work permit run out of time at the end of the work permit because they don't have one year of work experience and they can't stay in Canada afterwards um, while waiting for their permanent residence. And they you know, are no longer eligible for the permanent residence. So um, it's not that everybody needs to have a three-year work permit, but you need to have a plan to see whether or not you do. Make sure that you stay in status. What's the first thing I talked to you guys about? Staying in status, okay? Maintain your status, because if you don't maintain your status and you get into a situation where you're studying or working illegally, you're in Canada illegally, that puts you in a whole different space than from someone who has been able to stay in status, okay? You may not be able to apply for many of the programs. You may be in hiding. It's not a situation that you wanna be in, okay? So make sure one, two, three, you, you know what you need to do, do what you need to do, and make sure you don't do what you shouldn't be doing, okay? If your application is rejected, um, contact a lawyer right away. So the 15 days from the date of rejection is if your application is in Canada. If you apply for study permit outside of Canada, it's actually 60 days for the date of rejection. But there is a very, that's a very specific timeline for the federal court, okay? Um, and it's not necessarily that you for sure want to go to federal court, but sometimes you just want at least to see what the reason was. Um, and the federal court will make the uh, Depart uh, Department of Justice get the reasons from the visa post to show you because the letters that you get may not be, uh, it's usually just a, a standard letter where they tick, tick, tick. It's not the actual reasons why your application was rejected. Okay, and so in order to make sure that you keep your ability to go to federal court, 60 days if it's study permits rejected from outside of Canada, 15 days if it's inside Canada, okay, um, make sure that you apply within the notice period. Um, and sometimes you say, well, I, I, I can just ask the visa post to reconsider. Um, I, you know, I call the call center and they said, just write a letter, okay? So listen, immigration is not like Amazon, okay? They're not, the call center is not necessarily there for your best interest. The call center represents the immigration. And when they tell you, give you advice, it's not necessarily always the best advice. If you go and write a letter to immigration, that is considered a reconsideration. And you only get one reconsideration account uh, attempt for each application. If you, they later, because you don't know what you're writing and they say, nope, we're not doing it. You come to me and say, Elizabeth, can you go and write another letter? Can you go and ask a reconsideration? I can say to you, you know what? I can't do it anymore because they're not even gonna consider my request because you've already had one kick out of the can and you only get one kick out of the can, okay? Um, there are also other timelines, uh, restoration of status, et cetera, okay? So make sure as soon as, if you get a rejection, you contact a lawyer right away. Hopefully you would have contacted a lawyer at stage one so that you don't get yourself into trouble. Uh, but if you haven't, and you get a rejection, contact lawyer right away. All right, so that's our information there. If you do wanna book a consultation to go for your own personal consultation, uh, let us know you've come to this webinar and uh, we'll be able to give you the seminar discount, 
Okay. So, uh, Laura, shall we go through some questions? Do we have some time for to go over some of these questions? Oh, you're on mute. Yes, Lisa, please. I think it's worth it. And I think some of them are waiting to hear from you. Okay, all right, great. So we have 10 minutes to uh, go through this. Um, Zia, what we'll do is we may or may not be able to answer everything. We're gonna go and pick and choose some of these questions. Um, and then if you wanted to ask about your own situation afterwards, you can book a consult, okay? Uh, Zia, do you see a question you'd like to an uh, answer there? Yeah, so big question for you, Elizabeth. What is happening on September 7th and how does it affect students? Right, so September 7th is really for people who did not qualify under the border restrictions to come as a non, as a discretion, because they were discretionary or optional travel. As students, you're non discretionary, non optional. So the September 7th doesn't necessarily apply to you because you could you can come long before September 7th. If you have parents who have visas or they are they have their ETAs and they wanted to visit Canada, okay? Their visits during the COVID restrictions would have been, no, you can't because it's uh, not a dis discretionary. You don't have to be here. After September 7th, they, if they are vaccinated properly and have waited the 14 days, they may be able to travel to Canada. Uh, I don't know about the Indian uh, travel ban, whether the, the flight ban, whether that's still in place. So you have to keep in mind if you're from that area, uh, but uh, that's what's happening September 7th. Um, so someone asked about Indian vaccines. Uh, will they work? Not at this time. So the only ones that are approved so far is again the Johnson and Johnson, AstraZeneca, uh, Moderna, and Pfizer. Yeah. So it, there's one that is very similar to AstraZeneca. It's almost like the same, right? And I think that's okay. Is it Covaxin or Co? Uh, there's one that's like the same as AstraZeneca. It's just made in India. I think that's on the approved list. But the other one, I know there's like two that are used there. Uh, we'll need to check the, the website. And the website constantly changes as well. Um, you know, there's all, always, they may be approving new vaccines and the government has said, we're gonna look into other vaccines and they may be approving more. So, you know, stay tuned for this, but it has to be on thinking the of, Sorry, Liz, the name that you're thinking of is the AstraZeneca slash the Shield. COVID shield, sorry, yeah. yes. COVID shield, that's, that's okay, yeah. Um, another question, uh, Zian? Yes, so the next question is, can I change programs um, once I've arrived in Canada? You can change programs once you've come to Canada. Uh, it's very important that you know why you're changing a program, not just because of life, but because of immigration as well. Okay, like I said, Nippy Singh has some, like in and of itself, the location and the fact that it's a university is very, very advantageous. Um, and the fact that it's a public university as well. So if you went to a private college in Brampton, a completely waste of time because you're not gonna be able to get the postgrad work permit, you're not gonna be able to get anything like that. Okay, so make sure that you have a plan. If you wanna change your program because of interest, if you wanna change your program of, you know, whatever it is, because you are not Canadian citizens or permanent residents, if you ever want to stay in Canada to immigrate, to work, you must keep in mind the immigration path. Um, Zia, uh, if someone is, doing something part-time this summer semester, uh, does that mean that they can't apply for a post-grad work permit? It depends, right? So it depends on um, whether that semester was considered to be a part of their uh, program, right? So if it was a regularly scheduled break or not. So basically we're going back to uh, the program in the school specifically to see what, whether there is a summer break 
And so then you're taking additional courses during your summer break, which is fine. Or if that summer semester was supposed to be a part of the regular uh, program itself. And so now you become a part-time student when you were supposed to be a full-time. So short answer is that it depends on the program and the school that you're uh, studying in. So anytime you guys are doing part-time studies, uh, and sometimes you just can't help it, right? You're, uh, you failed a class before and you need to do it part-time afterwards because you couldn't do these studies, etc. cetera. Um, we have had success asking for exemptions due to specific circumstances. I normally advise you not to get your t yourself into those situations because you know you don't want to you don't want to face that kind of situation. If you can help it, be full time student all the time, okay? Except the last semester, that's recognized as it doesn't matter. If at any time you can't help it and you are part time, uh, do speak to a lawyer because if you don't explain properly to immigration why it is that you needed to be part-time at that situation um, and ask for specific exemption, the immigration officer will likely just reject your application. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I was just going to say, can you go over the ability to work on your study permit um, and specifically if there is a limit uh, to working on campus? So if you're working on campus, there is no limit if you're a full-time student. I'm talking about full-time student all the time, okay? If you're a part-time student, except in the last semester, then you're not able to work at all. When you're a full-time student on campus, you can work as much as you want and you can work part-time as well. I don't know how you're gonna get your studies done, Okay, and I don't know, and Lori, is there any limits for nipping, for working for the students at all, or? No. No, okay. So if you wanted to, you could do that, um, but it's the off-campus that has the limit on hours when you're studying, uh, limits you to 20 hours a week. Yeah. And when you're on break, summer break, scheduled breaks, you can work full time. All right, um, by the way, we will be sending the presentation uh, and recording to you by email. Uh, we'll put the recording on our website and YouTube and you can, um, you can watch it there, okay? Um, so there was a question, the human capital stream, does it only apply for students who have completed their bachelor's from Canada only? No. So the human capital priority stream, your education can be from Canada or from outside of Canada. Um, but if it is from outside of Canada, then you do need to have an education assessment to show that it is equivalent to a Canadian bachelor's. Okay. All right. We're getting a lot of questions about specifically how an individual can qualify and what are the best options for them, particularly um, in applying for permanent residence or um, yeah, applying for permanent residence. Um, Elizabeth, how can a person determine that? Yeah, it, it, you, can't, you can't just go to a doctor. Let's say you go to a doctor and say, I need to get well, what can I do, right? You have to go to a doctor and they have to examine you. Same thing with your immigration situation. You have to come to us and we have to go through your circumstances and give you a plan. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to come to our office. In fact, our office, because of COVID, is not open to the public right now. We do everything through video conference, whether you're in Canada or outside of Canada. Anywhere, we can do a video conference through Zoom and we can go through uh, your specific situation. And do tell us that you've come to this webinar, or if you watch us afterwards, do tell us you watch the webinar, it will give you the student discount, okay? Um, all right, uh, so I think there's a lot of questions about individual cases. Um, uh, 
So is it possible to apply for more than one PR program? So for example, if someone yeah. qualifies for Express Entry and an Ontario program at the same time? Yes, you can. Um, sometimes you don't need to, it might be a waste of money to do it. But sometimes, you know, in this kind of climate, people just don't know. And uh, oftentimes people do apply for different programs. You only get one PR in the end, but you can have different pathways to get there. Okay. Um, one last question, Zia, can you just go over applying for the postgrad, this uh, person asked, apply for postgrad 90 days within the end of the program or within the expiry date of our study permit? I think they're kind of confused. Which one is it? Okay. So when you finish your program of study, uh, when you're in Canada, your study permit itself will become invalid either 90 days following the end of your program. And so that's the, when we say the end of your program, we're talking about when you've received written confirmation that you've completed your program, or if, you're, if the expiry date on it is before those 90 days, then your expiry date. Okay, you want to apply for the postgrad work permit before the end of your study permit, right? So either before the expiry date or before that 90 days, because in order to be able to work full time while you're waiting for a decision on that postgrad work permit, um, you do need to have a valid study permit at the time of your application. Okay, so it's really important. Yes, the website says 180 days. But in order to be able to work in Canada while waiting for that postgrad work permit, the 90 days is the date that you should be thinking about. Okay, so whichever comes first, whichever comes mm -hmm. first. Okay, guys, I think time is up for us. Um, and uh, but thank you all for your wonderful questions. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth and Sia. I think uh, all the students got. Uh, what they wanted to know today, and they know the route now. Uh, if anybody wants more advice, so all the information was there, I think they will contact you. But thank you, really uh, grateful because of what happened here today. Well, thank you so much for, for hosting, uh, Laura. Okay, guys, take care, stay safe. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.